Okay. <coughs> I, should, I should tell you at the outset that I can't come here and tell you now what we're going to put in our guidance on breakthrough therapy. <laughs> so I have to be reasonably uh, discreet about this. And my task was actually to tell you what the past uh, programs directed at uh, innovative therapies we're doing and then we can compare that with what's going to happen uh, now. So. <coughs> Not easy to read. Um, uh, for a long time, um, yeah, not really surprisingly, FDA has had a major interest in drugs that really made a therapeutic difference. I mean, how could it be otherwise? What would you focus on? Uh, things that treat a serious disease, uh, uh, or uh, where the treatments were clearly better than what was available. Actually, I understand. <laughs> Um, and interestingly enough, uh, in, a, in a section of the regulations that people mostly don't read, uh, we laid all this out. Uh, I, I advise you, if you've never done so, to read uh, what's called subpart E of the IND regulations. It's uh, section 312.80. Because, um, and I'm going to talk about that and say what it says, and then I'm going to tell you about three specific <clears throat> Uh, pathways uh, that are in use, uh, priority review, accelerated approval, and fast track designation. Because it's important to realize what's new and what's um, not new. And breakthrough concept has some new things that are important. I'll get to that at the end. Uh, in all of these cases uh, where we're going to uh, expedite development and think about how to do it, uh, what's important is the severity of the disease, the value of the treatment, and the lack of good alternatives. I mean, that's not surprising. That would be what constitutes something. Something that overcomes those problems is obviously what's important. Um, so turning to subpart E, which, as I said, really is a good read. It's for drugs intended to treat life-threatening and severely debilitating diseases. And it dates from uh, 1988. This was a long time ago. Um, we, we wrote a regulation uh, that was intended to establish procedures to expedite the development, evaluation, and marketing of new therapies intended to treat pro uh, persons with life-threatening and severely debilitating illnesses, especially where no satisfactory alternative therapy exists. Sound familiar? Um, oh, that's right. Sorry. I forgot. You can't see me. Okay, good. <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> you can't see this. Okay. Um, now, without without changing the statutory standards for safety and effectiveness, uh, what, what this is what the subpart E said: the diversity of drugs, the wide range of them, and the diverse uses of these drugs has led FDA to determine that it's appropriate to exercise the broadest flexibility in applying the statutory standards. Okay. 1988. Um, this reflects the recognition that physicians and patients are generally willing to accept greater risks or side effects from drugs that treat life-threatening and severely debilitating diseases, and that the benefits of the drug need to be evaluated in light of the severity of the disease being treated. Um, all principles that have subsequently uh, uh, come forward in other, in other documents. So what did subpart E offer? How is it going to do this? Uh, the, the goal is obvious, but what does that turn out to mean? Well, one thing was the thing we think is the best thing FDA can do for anybody, which is meet with you. Um, I know there's a certain arrogance in that. Um, so it, it, it called for early consultation on the design of the preclinical and clinical trials. Um, maybe you're doing too much animal stuff. Maybe it's more than is needed for the actual trials. Um, it specifically says that bringing in outside experts uh, or advisory committee members uh, might be appropriate. It called for pre-IND meetings uh, to figure out what the animal studies needed to go forward were and to talk about the design of the phase one trials. It talked about having end of phase one studies, uh, end of phase one meetings, the purpose of which was to develop um, uh, the next studies, the next controlled trials, that might do the job all by themselves. The idea that you always have to have phase one, two, and three, is, that is not correct. Um, uh, and, and as uh, Rick Pastor could point out, 
we have dozens of drugs proved on what you'd call phase one studies, single arm, uh, single arm studies, and many on the first control trials phase two. So there's no requirement anywhere in, anywhere in the regulations or in practice that there always has to be phase one, two, and three. You show something wonderful in a phase two study, uh, that's fine. In fact, the distinction between a phase two study and a phase three study in terms of design, uh, there isn't that. Uh, phase two studies can be well, properly controlled studies. They're just usually a little smaller. Um, it's specifically called for having treatment protocols to provide access for people. And it said, we've got to use the risk benefit analysis in doing this. I mean, that won't surprise you. What else could you do when you're talking about a drug? Uh, and it's supposed to take into consideration the severity of the disease and the absence of satisfactory alternative therapy when you're doing your risk benefit consideration. Um, as I said, sounds familiar. So that was there, but obviously people didn't think that was enough. And that therefore, therefore, um, this organization and Congress uh, talked about breakthrough therapy because they must not have thought that was enough. And I'll, I'll come back to why maybe it wasn't, even though the intent and the general principles were there. So let's, let's do a couple of other things. Um, already in existence um, for, in some sense, the same kinds of drugs we're talking about here is uh, review classification uh, for a priority review. Actually, ranking uh, NDAs goes back probably 30 years. We used to rank them as A, B, and C. Then we turned it to priority and, and uh, standard. Uh, the basis for priority designation is preliminary estimates indicate that the drug product is approved, has the power, has the potential to provide safe and effective therapy if there's no satisfactory treatment, a significant improvement compared to marketed products. Sounds like the same thing that breakthrough therapy is supposed to do, and it is. Um, the significant improvement could be increased effectiveness, elimination or reduction of a treatment and limiting uh, side, uh, a drug reaction, documented enhancement of patient compliance, that's an interesting one, you don't see that very often, or evidence of safety and effectiveness in a new population. Those are all bases for prior reviews, and I, <clears throat> I see John Jenkins in the room, and he can correct me, but I think something like 30% of approvals are now, uh, are now prior, for priority, but uh, he can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, <clears throat> note that whether a drug is P or S is totally about the timing of the review. That's the only thing it affects. It changes the time from 10 months to 6 months. Uh, it doesn't talk at all about what kind of data you need, so it's not about that. Okay. Uh, next one is accelerated approval, <clears throat> which to a degree has been uh, expanded in Asia. What it, what it originally was, um, uh, and everybody attributes this to AIDS. We were actually working on this rule before AIDS came, came up, because we knew there were uh, situations where uh, you should start thinking about uh, relying on a surrogate if you weren't too sure about. Anyway, it allows approval of a drug uh, based on a surrogate endpoint, quote, reasonably likely, based on epidemiologic, therapeutic, pathophysiologic, et cetera, to uh, predict an actual clinical benefit. This is clearly lower than the standard we use where we base full and final approval on, on surrogate endpoints. We approve drugs for blood pressure lowering, uh, not under accelerated approval, but because we know lowering blood pressure is good for you. Uh, similarly, LDL cholesterol, at least with statins, and, and all of those things. And there, there are approvals by the oncology group based on dramatic long-term uh, responses in, in single-arm studies, which is still considered a surrogate endpoint, that can be full approval. It doesn't have to be. So if it's convincing enough, it's okay. Where it's not completely convincing, but is reasonably likely to uh, lead to a, a, a clinical benefit, that's when we use the accelerated approval rule. And that, of course, requires that you then set set out to do the studies that show the actual clinical benefit. The original rule also included a possibility that you could have an actual clinical benefit, but it wasn't really enough to be convincing and didn't tell you about the ultimate benefit. A good example would be, would be heart failure, where after some very bad experiences, we probably wouldn't approve a drug for symptomatic treatment anyway, but just pretending that we didn't have those bad experiences you might have uh, an effect on short-term exercise tolerance, but you, what you really want to know is whether it improves survival. Uh, same thing could come up in pulmonary hypertension, where 
what the outcome is is important. Anyway, this gives us authority to approve a drug under accelerated approval for a modest clinical benefit on condition that the ultimate clinical benefit be, uh, be determined. And FIDASIA expands on that and makes it very clear. How often we're going to do that uh, remains to be seen because after all, we can approve a drug just on the basis of the clinical benefit. You don't have to have survival data, but sometimes that might be important. Um, and then it also allows restrict, uh, approval with restrictions uh, for safety. Okay. okay, let's fast track. Um, fast track resembles breakthrough in a number of ways, but there are a couple of very important distinctions. It was designed to facilitate the development and expedite the review of new drugs, same deal, intended to treat serious or life-threatening conditions, um, it noted specifically, this is interesting, that if you had a serious and life-threatening condition, you could study some trivial benefit in that life-threatening in those people, but that's not what this is about. It has to be studying the bad thing um, that, uh, in, in, in the disease. And uh, this is for drugs that, that demonstrate the potential to address an unmet medical need. Um, um, now, FIDAMA actually incorporated the whole fast track provisions because fast track includes the potential for accelerated approval and it endorsed what's called a rolling review where you submit data as you, as you get it. Um, the probably important fact is that you could be designated as fast track even if you didn't have a clinical evidence of a benefit but the animal data were really convincing or you hit some new target uh, or something like that. It did not specifically call for clinical data. And fast track is mostly about having a good development process, thinking about the design of trials, maybe uh, deciding that the first controlled trials, the so-called phase two trials, would do the job, and, and so on. All right. And so what would we do? Uh, on the sponsor request, we would um, try to facilitate and expedite the review of such drugs, um, and uh, is look at the bottom of the slide is how the potential to meet an unmet need would be demonstrated. Well, one is by a pharmacologic animal model. Uh, as data emerge, uh, they should be consistent and so on. But it didn't require clinical evidence, at least not initially. Okay, so what do we do? What do we do about fast track? Um, well, we have pre IND meetings to get the appropriate preclinical data. We have an end of phase one meeting, same as called for in 312.82, to see whether the first phase two control trials could do the job. And you have an end of phase two meeting to agree on the design of phase three trials. This is all the guidance on this uh, document. How successful it's been, um, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly many drugs have been approved with modest databases. Um, I just want to mention briefly other thing, I'm getting looked at while I'm taking too much time. Um, it's, it's important to recognize, because these relate to these conditions too, that we are very explicit in a number of places that the safety database depends on how important the drug is. So you can have much smaller safety databases if the drug does something wonderful. It's important to remember that. Um, we have a rule that says we can rely on a single study if it's persuasive with confirmatory evidence. We use that a lot. Uh, an analysis of orphan drugs shows that we very regularly use that. And then we sometimes accept historical controls, which these single arm studies uh, are, they're, they're baseline controls. It's particularly prominent in cancer because you really can tell whether a tumor went away and it wouldn't have done that spontaneously. It's a very good setting for innovative designs. And one designs, and as Harold said, even a single patient can uh, tell you something wonderful is going on. Almost done. So what's new? What, 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 is, what is the new thing? Um, well, in brief, I don't think the concepts are entirely new, but what, what I think is new is the obligation for the agency uh, under, under guidance from the legislature to pay particular attention to this and to get its house together and make sure we do a similar behavior in all divisions, in all offices, and think about it. So there's no question that um, people within the agency at all levels, uh, w within CEDAR at all levels, are going to be looking at the request for breakthrough designation and watching what we do to help develop the process. So that means biometrics could be looking closely at the study designs that we're thinking about and 
there will be a record and we're going to be obliged to report on what we're doing. And that is a change because Fast Track didn't really quite do that. Now, we, we make our decisions public and everybody knows what they are, but this is much more clearly <coughs> a, a message that we need to have a systematic and organized approach. We're going to be writing guidance. Uh, the documents, the papers that uh, have been written here will certainly help us in thinking about that guidance. And that's what we're doing. So I think it does represent an important change, not so much in concept, because we've always been interested in this, but in the practical application of these things. Thanks. Sorry I went over.